Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's episode, we're going to talk about pH indicators. So, we're going to define what we mean by a pH indicator. We're going to explain or, or go through some examples of how indicators can be useful. We're going to look at some examples of, of indicators that we'd come across. Um, and then think about the science behind how they actually work. So firstly, what is a pH indicator? So a pH indicator is a substance, a compound that changes colour in response to a change or, or, or of pH or to certain, certain kind of level of pH. pH is a measure of how acidic or basic uh, a solution is. And so when the, the solution changes from acid to base or, or vice versa, that indicators will change colour. They tend to have two different coloured forms or versions. You know, maybe one is colourless and one has a colour, or maybe it's, you know, one's yellow and one's blue, one's red and one's green, one's, you know, red and yellow, whatever that might be. It varies from, um, from substance to substance. But the fact that it's got two different colours means that then when um, the, the pH is, is different, we can see it visually. Um, so how do we use indicators? So we, we are looking at situations in everyday life, we might want to test how acidic something is. So maybe we're testing soil to see if it's appropriate for growing vegetables or growing um, native plants. The soil requirements of different plants um, are varied. Um, we're testing swimming pool water or drinking water to check and see that it's not too acidic or too alkaline or basic. You know, or fish tank or aquarium water where, you know, aquatic life needs a particular level of acidity. Um, you know, we can also use it in a lab context to find the endpoint of a reaction between an acid and a base. We're going to look at that in, in a future video, but um, seeing that an indicator can tell us when, uh, by changing colour, it tells us when we've arrived at a certain level. Um, and so some examples of indicators. You can see, um, I, I know that the photo is a little bit glary. Okay, so you can see the names of some different indicators and then the colours that they produce at different levels of acidity. Um, going from pH 1 kind of all the way up, you can see the colour ranges. So, so th there's a kind of a set of six that we're going to focus on a bit more specifically. Um, so litmus is one, you can see that here. Then we've got phenolphthalein, which is this one here. We've got methyl orange, which is not on this list and neither is methyl red, um, but they're two common ones we'd encounter. Then we've got bromothymol blue and we've also got bromocresol green. Okay, so they're the set of six that we're just going to focus on a little bit now. But you can see that we have different indicators that give us different um, colours at different levels of pH, which means that um, th they are very useful tools for a range of situations, but it's about picking the right one for the situation that we're after. Um, and so here we can see these six. These are the, the chemical kind of structures of these different compounds. Now you're not going to need to be able to draw these, but I just want to show you that we use these as acid base indicators, but their structures are wildly different. The only two which are um, really closely related are these two, the methyl ones down the bottom, the methyl orange and methyl red are by far the most closely related. The, the little group up here is the thing that is different. So we've got this C-O-O-H over here, and we've got this sulfur or this kind of sulfate group up here which is, is what's different, okay? But the, the key ingredient is that all of these compounds, part of their structure will change depending on whether um, the solution is acidic or basic. Um, and the reason that these different indicators are useful is that they will change from one colour to another over a, a known pH range, okay? So you can see here that they have got a certain colour when the pH is less than a certain number and a certain colour when the pH is greater than another number. And then what happens is that the in-between of these two values, pH is a spectrum, that then in between these pH values that the colour is, is intermediate. It's changing from one version to the other. Yeah, at some point you'll get a 50-50 mixture and you'll get an in-between colour. So for example, litmus is red when it's more acidic or, or pH less than 5. It's blue when it's greater than 7.6, which means between 5 and 7.6, it's changing from red to blue. So you get various shades of purple. When you're kind of exactly in between, you're going to get a really specific purple colour. Um, you know, likewise, phenolphthalein, you go from colourless to a reddish kind of bright pink sort of colour, which means that in between, you're going to get a pale pink. And so the idea is that that's going to become quite relevant when we look at 
um, indicators in the lab being able to tell us when we reach a very specific pH. But you can see that the colours that they turn and the pHs at which they change vary from compound to compound. That's what makes them so useful. We have different tools for different jobs or different applications, okay, and different colour combinations that we might want to um, be observing. Um, and so we're going to use them in a range of contexts. So how do indicators actually work? What's the science behind how this colour change actually happens? Well, this is the equilibrium. This is a general equilibrium we're going to talk about for an indicator. Okay, so we've got some kind of structure of the molecule that then it has an extra hydrogen on it, at, you know, in one form, and that hydrogen ion's been taken away in another form. So we've got an equilibrium between these two different coloured versions. So let's look at, say, bromothymol blue, which has a yellow and a blue version. Okay, so what? happens then is that we're changing from yellow to blue but this is an equilibrium like any other that we've studied that Le Chatelier's principle is going to influence what happens here. So let's say for example we're talking an acidic solution. Something that's an acidic solution has a high concentration of hydrogen ions or hydronium ions. Okay so that is very high levels of H plus. What that's going to do is that then because those levels are high we're going to shift the equilibrium to the left hand side in order to use them up. They're going to connect with any available of this, this blue version to form the yellow version. So the yellow form is what's going to predominate or be mostly found in an acidic solution. But what about if it's a basic solution? Well, we've still got our yellow and blue versions. That's part of the chemical structure. But so in a basic solution, we have a low concentration of H plus because hydroxide ions from the base react with and neutralize these ions to form water. So we've basically stripped these out of the system by adding in something that's going to remove them. So thinking about Le Chatelier's principle, the equilibrium is now going to shift to the right to replace them. That then all of those hydrogen ions have been taken away, so it's trying to shift and replace them. We're going to get the blue form predominating when the solution is basic. But what about if it's not acidic or basic? What about if it's in the middle? What if it's neutral? So we've still got yellow and blue versions, but we've kind of got an intermediate H plus concentration. We've got, you know, we've got some of it, we don't have heaps of it, we don't have low amounts. So equilibrium position is going to be in the middle. We haven't shifted towards the left or the right, we've got fairly equal amounts of both. Equal amounts of yellow and blue make a green solution. So green tells us when we've passed this middle point, the tipping point between these two colours. Okay, and so the green is kind of what can be very useful to look for. All right, so we've identified what is a pH indicator, a compound that changes colour with the change in acidity. That we've seen that indicators have a range of different uses in everyday life and in the lab. We looked at some examples of common um, commercial or lab indicators that we would encounter and we've also looked at the science behind the equilibrium that explains how they work. Thanks very much for watching, don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye for now.